I love hearing I love hearing little voices. And when 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 they get excited, it gives me just a bit of a an understanding there that that uh maybe the kingdom of heaven is like a child. So very quickly, I'm going to read to us from the passage we were in last week. We were in Romans chapter 6. We're going to be reading verses 15 through 23. And so I invite you to open your Bibles there as well to Romans 6, and we're going to read together. And I want these words to hit us again today. It says, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me pray for us very quickly. God, as I've just read these verses, there is a clear and evident calling on the life of the believer. We're not just called out of sin and out of darkness. We're not just called to freedom from those things. But God, we are called to have you as our master be slaves of yours. Help us to hate the things that you hate, our sin, our former way of life. Help us to love the things that you love, our life with you, your son Jesus, who has provided this means of freedom and this means of a new kind of slavery. It's in your son's name I do ask these things and for his sake. Amen. So last week, if you were here, you looked at these verses and we talked about how all of creation, all of humanity are born under the bondage of sin. It started in the garden with Adam and Eve, and we have been living in that curse ever since. In a very odd and strange way, we've been living as dead men and women in our hearts and in our souls. That is the situation that all people find themselves in. Psalm 51.5 says that we were brought forth in iniquity and in sin our mother conceived us. Psalm 58.3 tells us the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth. 
speaking lies. And so we are born into sin, and that means that we are born with sin as our very cruel, very evil, very perverse master. We're captive as slaves in that awful reality. And last week we took time, we won't do a a lot of it today, but we looked at several places in the Scripture where a word appears in the Greek language, and that word is doulos. And when that word appears in the Greek language, English translators have often taken that word doulos and they've translated it to servant or to bond servant. But that's not what the word means. The word doulos means slave. Here in Romans 6, 15 through 23, doulos appears several times and they do translate it as slave in the passage that we read In other places they don't. And we we looked at maybe why is that? Why do we take that word doulos, which can only mean slave, and why is it translated into servant in the English language? And we've looked at the fact that, that in our country, in our history, there is an evil, an evil thought that comes to our mind when we think of slavery, when you close your eyes and when you think of what a slave's life looks like, it's not good. It's evil. It's wicked. It's perverse. It's vile. And we think that was our history, but even today, if we talk about slavery today, human trafficking is booming throughout this world and throughout this country, and when we think of slavery, our mind quickly jumps to those things, to the idea of evil and suffering. And so what I fear we've done, and I went over these terms last week, is rather than taking the text and rather than practicing exegesis, which I'll remind you, exegesis is looking at the the words of Scripture, letting the words speak for themselves, and letting that meaning exit the book itself and impact our lives where we are. Rather than letting the book impact us through exegesis, we've practiced eisegesis which is, I have thoughts, I have ideas, I have a viewpoint in my mind, and I bring that to the Scripture. Because slavery in our nation's history and right now is so wrapped up in sin, when we hear in Romans 6, 15 through 23, that we're called out of slavery, we say, yes! And then when we hear, but we're called to be slaves of righteousness or slaves to God, we think, ooh, ooh, that, 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 that hurts a bit. Because world-made slavery, man-made slavery, is always evil. Always. No exception. We've never seen what this talks about. Or at least we don't think we have. Now, let me make this very clear that even though I do believe very strongly that that there has been a mistranslation, that doulos should be translated slave, and that where they translate doulos into servant, it is a, a mistranslation. Even though I do say that, and I'm not ashamed to say that, I still want to tell you that the book that you hold in your lap, the very Bible that you have in your hands, it is still magnificent. It is wonderful. 
it is good. In fact, John MacArthur, he wrote a book uh, just simply titled Slave. And in it, he brought to light the mistranslation of doulos and, and one of um, the young ladies who was at uh, the seminary where he, where he is came forward and asked him if they've missed such a big point. If they've mistranslated there, how can we trust our Bibles? John MacArthur looked at her and he said, that's an excellent question said the reality is that after 50 years of studying the Greek language, the Hebrew language, looking at the translations through English, that in all 50 years of him doing it, and if you guys have ever listened to a a John MacArthur sermon or read a book of his, he seems to be on a different, in a different ball field than I am, or any of us, uh, any person that I know. But after 50 years of diving into the scriptures, to teach it, to preach it. He said, this is the only word I've ever seen like this. He said, that's why I brought it to light. He said, there's nothing like this anywhere else in the Bible. So understand the book you hold in your hand, the English translation you have, is beautiful and it is magnificent and it is powerfully preserved. Even in some of the newer translations, they are going back and they are correcting that mistake. But if we're going to drive home the point that we are slaves to God, if we're going to say that that's what the Scripture teaches, if that's really the Word, and our minds get wrapped up with what world-made slavery looks like, we had to ask the question last week, what does God-made slavery look like? What is his slavery? Because it can't be tainted by sin. It can't be wrapped up in evil. If it's God made, it is good and it is perfect and it is right. But we, in our minds, we can't jump there by viewing anything we've seen in the past. So what does it look like? That's the job that I have today is to present to you what does God made slavery look like and the first thing I have to tell you the first thing that I need to bring to your attention is if sin was our master if sin was the one who lorded over us God made slavery means this You have a new master. You are not held under a cruel and vicious and evil and conniving master. No, you have a new master. And it is God. The Lord who created you is your master. He is your king. The scripture uses another Greek term, for that, and it's the term kurios. I didn't really have to do that, but I thought since I showed you doulos last week, I'll show you the God side of it. It's kurios. God is our master. It's translated as master in the Bible. It's translated as Lord in the Bible. And it means it for everything that it is. He is now over you. You are no longer under a cruel and vicious master. You are no longer under a cruel and vicious curios. You are now under the Lord Himself. And you might sit there and say, what makes Him so different? I'm glad you asked. Isaiah 43 6 through 7 tells us this. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called 
by not my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. This master, this Lord has created you. And he's created you for his glory. What does it mean to glorify God? The definition I give the kids, actually, kids, what does it mean to glorify God? To make God famous. We are created for his glory. We're back under the one who made us. Not only that, but in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, it tells us, that we are purchased from sin by this master, by this kurios. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. You are His because He created you. You are His because He has purchased you. You have been bought with a price. He chose you when he said, I will purchase you for my own. Not only that, I love this. We're also written on. In Revelation 3, Verse 12, it says this, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar. And the one who conquers in the context is the believer. They conquer because of what Christ has done. But the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Not only does it say that, Revelation 14, 1 says, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name on his, uh, uh, on his forehead written. We've been created by God. We've been purchased by God. And He is divinely written on us. What does that mean? If you've ever seen the movie Toy Story, maybe you have an idea of what that means. Toy Story is ob obviously about toys. And when their owner, Andy, receives a new toy, he always writes his name, Andy, on the toy. Because that's Andy's toy, it's no one else's. We have been written on. We are God's. We are no one else's. And so, perhaps still we're wrapped up in this mindset that, yeah, but it's still slavery. It's still having a new master. It's still having him lord over me. Well, what makes it different our new master makes it different. See, God is holy. Holy means different than anything else we could ever want or desire. It means perfect in righteousness. It means morally upright. God himself is holy. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2 says, There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Psalm 96.9 says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Isaiah 6.3, when Isaiah has a vision before the throne room of God himself, the cherubs are flying around. They say, Holy, Holy, Holy. Revelation 4.8, they're still doing it. Saying, holy, holy, holy. First Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 16 tells us 
to be holy, for our God is holy. He is different. He's perfect. He's upright. There is no slave owner in this world who has ever been like God, nor will he ever be like God. We have a holy new master. And that could be enough. We could sit there and say, okay, we have a new master. And that's what makes this slavery so different. And we could jump into the rest of who God is. And we could pour into the scriptures. And we could just look for the rest of our time at what makes this God so amazing. What makes him so grand. We could do that and we would have spent our time wonderfully. But what I want to do for the remainder of our time is I want to look at two illustrations that not only shows us who our master is, who our curios is, but shows us the nature of his mastery. Shows us the nature of his lordship. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. The first illustration is this. The first thing you have to understand is that with a new master comes a new yoke. You and I, if we are in Christ, we have a new yoke. Some of you might not know what a yoke is. Some of the younger ones here. A yoke is simply this. It was a, a tool or it was a device that the master would set upon his cattle, his cows, his donkey. He would put a yoke upon its shoulders. And that yoke was held by oftentimes rods of iron to a plow at the other end of that yoke. And the animal would pull and that yoke would bear down on it, and so it would plow the field. Galatians 5.1 tells us that we should not submit again to a yoke of slavery. When we're slaves to sin, we are told constantly, we're reminded that we're not good enough. Let me go ahead and say this. We're we're really not. We're told, even when we look in the Scripture, 1 Peter, be holy for I am holy. And if we're still under that bondage of sin and death, then what we think is, well, then I've got to be holy. I've I've got to plow the field. I've got to work. I've got to pull this yoke. I have to do the work to make me holy like my God is holy. Sin will put you under that kind of a yoke. And along the way, it will give you every pleasure it can think of. It will give you perhaps money or fame. Perhaps it will give you a promotion. Whatever you think you really, really want, it will try to give you those things to appease you along the way. But at the end of it, you still have not been holy the way God is holy. The reason for that is because no matter what our deeds, no matter what our work, no matter how hard we try, we can never be like God. Isaiah 64, 6 tells us that our righteousness, the very best deeds that we can do, the very very pinnacle of our achievement is only a filthy rag unto God. Romans 3, 9 through 12 tells us this. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. 
as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one st- understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. We're not good. We're certainly not holy. No matter how hard we try, we'll never be good enough on our own. That's the yoke of slavery to sin. But praise be to God. We have a new yoke. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, tells us this. This is Jesus speaking. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. For your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A new yoke, but it's still a yoke. So, what does it mean to be under a new yoke? Is it not still a burden upon us? No. His yoke is easy, his burden is light. The reality we have to come to is an understanding that what Jesus accomplished for us is something that no master has ever done in this world and will ever do in this world. Jesus said, and you can look it up in Matthew 3.15 when he came to be baptized by John, that he came to fulfill all righteousness. So the reality is this. The field is plowed before, or is before us. The yoke is upon us. The command is there, be holy for I am holy. And so we look at this field and we think, well, I've got to plow the field. Christ places His yoke upon us though. And this is an illustration I got from John Piper. And I, I can close my eyes and visualize it. Maybe you can do the same. Maybe it'll cause you to smile as much as it has for me. But this is the illustration here that the yoke of Christ is a yoke. It's placed upon you. You are strapped in. You've got the rods of iron that lead back to the plow. Christ is at the plow. John Piper says, Christ takes the plow and with Popeye-like forearms, twists the plow, the rods of iron take the yoke, suspend you in the air so that you're... And then Christ plows the field. And you sit there dangling, looking like a fool. This is easy. This is light. And Christ... Christ Himself, your Master, your Curios, your Lord, He plows the field. We have a new yoke. A yoke where our Master accomplishes. Not a yoke that works us to death and then never sees life. Second illustration is this. We have a new cross. Romans 6.23, and and I read it to you earlier. Let me read it to you. Again, it says this. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The truth is, at the beginning of that, we hear exactly what we get. If we're under that bondage, of sin, slavery to death, under that curse, if we have not been placed under the lordship of Christ, 
in our wage, at the end of our day, the field we plow, it only leads to death. And so we see some strange things in Scripture about what death for a Christian looks like. Let me read Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 through 23. It says this, And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him in the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. In our death, in our life in sin, death is so final and it is so wicked. And this is why this is why the commandment is there that, that if a man is hanged on a tree, he's a curse. Because when a person was hanged on a tree, when that person was killed, they were raised, elevated up, so that everyone could see their death. Everyone could see that they got the justice they deserved. Because of our open rebellion to Christ and sin because of our open resentment in the things that he has done we sit there and we might think then we don't want to be publicly displayed or put up on shame but Luke chapter 9 verse 23 tells us something very very different Luke 9, verse 23, says this, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, in in slavery to sin, we die a death that we've earned when people see our death in sin it is to stand as an illustration for the rest of the world that sin is evil and sin will only lead you to death the worst kind of a death is to be put on death where you are publicly being displayed so that everyone can see your crimes That's what happens when we are under bondage to sin. That's the death we have. But we're free from sin. We don't have to bear that cross. We don't have to be hanged on that tree, do we? But then Christ says, take up your cross and follow him. It's because of this, and this is a powerful illustration from Scripture. What does the cross of Christ look like? What does taking up the cross and following after him daily look like and and it's in every single one of the gospels and it's only you only get one verse in all these gospels it's just a thrown away kind of verse oftentimes because we don't know what to do with it but in Luke chapter 23 verse 26 it says this this Jesus is about to be crucified he's about to be hanged on a cross and this is what it says and as they led him away They seized one Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. We're introduced to a man named Simon and we recognize that Simon carried the cross of the Savior. We recognize that Simon is only identified in all of history as carrying the cross of Christ. And I want to submit to you that maybe that is a good illustration of what it looks like to take up your cross daily and follow after him. Why is it? Because of this. Simon was compelled to take the cross and to carry it. So too are we. Take up your cross daily and follow after him. 
Simon's life is so closely linked to the life, the death of Christ that we know nothing about him apart from who he walked with. We know nothing about him except that he took up the cross and carried it. We also know that he carried that cross but he did not bear that cross. He carried the cross but he didn't die the death of the cross. He might have walked with it. He might have been closely linked to Jesus. He might have been right beside him or right behind him every step of the way but when it came to what was going to fill that cross it was not Simon it was the Savior it was Jesus himself and so too we when we think of the cross that we are called to carry with Christ understand it's true Take up your cross daily and follow Him. But if you are in Christ, you may carry it, but you do not bear it. There is one who bore that cross. And He did it so that we could have redemption through His blood. We could be bought with a price. We could be His. That's our Master. That's our Lord. Galatians 3 13 through 15 puts it beautifully when it says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith Christ has given us a new cross. He has given us a new yoke. Christ is our new master. So where does that leave us? Miraculously, beautifully, I am now a new slave. And those in Christ are a new slave. You see, we're told to plow. We're told to dig a field that is already finished. We're told to carry a cross that's already been born. We're told to walk in righteousness when that righteousness has already been fulfilled. And what master has ever told his slave... Go to the field, dig the field, plow it. And when the slave walked out to that field, he looked at the landscape of all that was set before him, all the work that he was to do, and he looks out there and he sees the field is already done. He sees the work is already accomplished, it's already finished. What slave has ever seen that from his master? We have. And then do you know what we hear? Do you know what is said to us? When we come back in and we say, Master, the the field is dug. Our Master looks at us and says, Well done, my good and faithful doulos. Well done, my slave. So here's the reality, a reality we get to walk in, a reality we get to live. We have Christ. He is our new master. If we are in Him, He has completed all of our toil, all of our, all of our work. And we see that we have an incredible response. 
Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. I read these verses last week, but I wanted to come back to them again. And he, meaning Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What is our response? Liberty! Freedom in Christ Jesus! In him alone! To put it in the way Paul put it. I have been set free from sin and I have become a slave to God Almighty. You see, we tie slavery to evil and to wickedness because that's all we've ever seen. That's not the slavery of our master. Everything we could see here is only a perverse illustration an evil illustration of what God, our Kurios, has provided for us, his doulos. So we must, if you, if you are compelled that this is where we want to be, not under the yoke of sin and death, not carrying a cross where the wage is death but under a yoke that is easy and a burden is light under a cross that is born for me if that is our hope then it's the hope of those outside of these walls as well and your task proclaim liberty proclaim freedom there is a world that is still under that yoke of slavery tell them your master. Tell them of your curios. Tell them I am a slave, but not like you. And then you proclaim liberty from sin and death. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. As the band comes up to play, we want to turn our minds now to we've heard the word of God so how do we respond? We proclaim liberty and we worship this great and glorious, amazing master. God, oh, how we love you. Oh, how we thank you for the reality of your son, Jesus, of who he is. We thank you, God, that he is our master to those who are in him. That we can proclaim liberty and freedom from all the bondage of sin and death, all of the wages of sin. We proclaim freedom and liberty from that. And we proclaim the goodness of our Lord and Savior, of our master. God, help us to sing not just because we're trying to sound good, but because, God, you desire the praises of your doulos. I pray that you would be glorified in these songs. It's in your son's name, Jesus, I do ask these things and for his sake. Amen.